He was the typical flashy influencer, or so I thought. Some said he ran legitimate businesses. Others accused him of running a Ponzi scheme. But as I dug deeper, the story just kept getting weirder and weirder. Where did his money actually come from? Trading Forex, crypto, dealing cars, scamming? The only thing that appeared certain was he owed money to the wrong people. The worst kind. The Barra Bravas. The most violent soccer fans in the world. And when he couldn't pay his debt, you won't believe what they did to him. With around 900,000 followers on Instagram, Fernando Perez Algaba appeared to be a large influencer from Argentina. The numerous pictures and videos of him driving exotic sports cars gave off the vibe that he was wealthy. Even news articles claimed he was a successful businessman. The New York Post labeled him as a crypto millionaire in their headline. They believed he was wealthy. Algaba amassed his fortune renting high-end vehicles in Miami and selling Forex and cryptocurrency and flashed his luxury lifestyle to his 900,000 plus Instagram followers. After further investigation, I think this was all a lie. The only thing that appears certain is he scammed the wrong people and cost him his life. Y esta gente mata por poder. Barra Brava is the name of organized supporters groups of football teams in Latin America, analogous to European ultras and British hooligans in providing fanatical support to their clubs and stadiums and provoking violence against rival fans as well as against the police. The Barra Bravas are not people you want to mess with or owe money to. The ranking order of who you do not want to be in debt to would be Putin first, then John Wick, then the Barra Bravas. They are extremely well connected in Argentina and their violence is on display frequently at soccer games. When the team returned to their training camp at the Villa Olimpica Stadium hours after the match, they suffered a brutal visit from the club supporters as cars ambushed some of the players. We arrived at the stadium to get our cars and go home. We came out and it was all dark when the cars of the Barra Brava came across us. There were probably five or six of them, striker Gianluca Prestiani told ESPN on Monday. They even told one of them, get out of the car or I'll shoot you twice in the legs, the 17-year-old forward said, adding that the incident is making him rethink staying at the club. Most Barra Bravas members are just rowdy fans, but their leaders are much more connected and much more violent. They are known to traffic narcotics, launder money, and commit other mob-esque crimes. They control everything about Argentinian football clubs from upper management decisions all the way down to ticket sales. There is an organized hierarchy and the clubs are not corporations. They have an elected chairman and at election time, the Barra Bravas follow and control their every move. Barra Bravas members often move up to hold city and even national political positions. At match time, they roam the stadium, the locker rooms, the parking lot, collecting cash along the way, earning up to 60,000 pesos per game day, which is about 16,000 US dollars. So when you take money from them, they are not happy and they are not forgiving. Fernando Perez Algaba learned this the hard way. As we'll see in a bit, the Barra Brava sent a chilling message. Fernando should have had plenty of money from his successful business ventures. So how did he end up in this mess, owing money to these violent thugs? This video required extensive research into Argentina, the Barras Bravas, and influencer culture, and I couldn't have done it without the Opera browser. This video highlights the value we should be placing in our safety in the real world, but we should also be considering how to protect ourselves when browsing the web. Check out how much more efficient my workflow is. The browser has a built-in VPN and ad blocker. These two features have allowed me to spend a lot more time researching topics like this one that require extensive use of a browser and in different territories. The built-in ad blocker makes surfing the web so much more enjoyable. I like their VPN which makes tracking web browsing much more difficult. And how awesome is having their own AI tool, Aria, on the sidebar? Built-in collaboration with OpenAI, Aria allows for easy problem solving like when I'm able to leverage it for finding more about Argentina and the crazy stories you're about to hear in a minute. Having quick access to messaging my team means I can put my phone on the other side of the room, boosting my productivity. You need to seriously check out Opera today to learn about all of their features and see why I recently made the switch to using their browser. Link in the description below for quick and free access to Opera Browser today. He was supposedly a wealthy Forex and crypto trader. With many news articles written about him, including the New York Post, you'd think he was a really important or wealthy influencer. The other day, someone left me a comment about Fernando possibly being a scammer. So off I went down the rabbit hole. What began as reading some headlines quickly became a perplexing mystery. The initial headline after Googling his name was shocking. At first glance, his success seemed real. There were tons of news outlets reporting on his death and claiming he was successful. But then I started noticing a strange pattern. They all said almost the exact same thing with no sourcing. They read like press releases. And there's images from his Instagram of him driving exotic sports cars. I realized in my investigation how easy it is to fool the newspapers. Some of you in the comments love to clown on the people who are easily fooled into giving money to a fake guru, but even the newspapers with more resources seem to have taken the bait 
or were just too lazy to do the actual research. When someone appears to be living a millionaire's lifestyle, it doesn't mean they are one. Of course, newspapers aren't going to have access to his tax returns, but it highlights the ease a good social media profile can have on fooling others. He has nearly 900,000 followers on Instagram, and his pictures gave off the vibe that he was an influencer with an audience. One of the last posts before his death only has 433 likes, while another has only 278 likes. Even a picture with a beautiful bright green Lambo only has 412 likes. It's likely a majority of his following was bought as many of his posts don't appear to have much engagement at all. This image of him and his dog and many others don't have any comments on them, which is typical of someone who doesn't want anyone seeing negative comments. It appears he might have been living a fake guru lifestyle where the image of success doesn't match the reality. Let's assess the possibility of him being a crypto and forex trader. This Instagram story indicates he needed some success to be able to afford a room full of traders supposedly working for him. During his final years, Algaba was involved in trading cryptocurrency from an office in Buenos Aires with over 25 employees. In order to have 25 employees, you need to be making some pretty serious dough trading, but it's also possible these traders were just students of his and he was getting a cut if they made any money. The location of this office room appears nice, but housing 12 employees in a single room doesn't scream financial success to me. The traders' friends who testified agreed when they stated that Perez Algaba had debts with different creditors. The claim is that he lost all his money during the crypto crash, but it's hard to find evidence he was even successful prior to that. Algaba subsequently founded a luxury car and jet ski rental firm in Miami before picking up and moving to Barcelona earlier this year. The New York Post alleges he had accumulated millions renting luxury vehicles and selling cryptocurrency. Luxury car rental businesses seem lucrative because of the daily rates of these cars, but I was skeptical he made any money with this business. The company, called Enjoy Rental Car, specializes in renting high and mid-range vehicles, boats, and jet skis for tourists and locals in the South Florida area. The idea for the company arose from Algaba's experience in investment and the luxury market. He has pictures and videos with exotic cars, he has a picture with jet skis, and he gives off the vibe that he was running a million dollar business, but it's hard to find any proof. A Florida business database search for his company yielded no results. A Google search for this business only yielded mentions in articles about his death. There aren't any websites for this company mentioned either. There's no evidence it exists. The only Florida business registered under Fernando Perez Algaba is Macro Express International Corporation, possibly some kind of holding company. The other name listed is Federico Natalini. According to his Instagram, he is the owner of Automotivi Cotroipo, a car dealership in Italy. On Fernando's Facebook page, he claims to be CEO of Luxury Car Rental. The Facebook company page looks enticing with exotic sports cars. Their Instagram page is still active today and posts numerous luxury vehicles all across Europe. They must be a broker connecting customers and owners of cars. And here's the website with links to their many luxury car options. Finally, something legitimate. But the company is located in, you guessed it, Italy. And I couldn't find any evidence that Fernando had ever been to Italy, not a single photo. Up to May 2020, he was also listed as the president of Sagipa SA, which sold cars, vans, and SUVs. One year later, the company changed name and shareholders to Tenalier SA. This picture was taken in Palermo, a neighborhood of Buenos Aires, Argentina, with the word Tenalier written in the back. Ironically, Palermo is also a city in southern Italy. The Facebook page for the auto company states that its address is in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and the website doesn't work. With the luxury car hire airport business, still appearing active in the Tenalier business sounding suspect, it's hard to decipher what his business in the car industry actually was. It seems like he was the type of person to bounce from business to business based on meeting new people or being presented new opportunities and never really developed longevity in any one industry. Or it could be that he was always owing people money and went on the run physically and in business. The victim's brother claimed that Algaba was simply a car salesman who did not do well in Bitcoin. Rodolfo, his brother, also noted that when he was 17, their father died and left an inheritance that Algaba used to start his business, hinting that the influencer didn't go from poor to posh as he seemed to suggest. In addition, the murdered trader showed up as a partner in a company called Luxury Scissors, engaging in hairdressing, aesthetics, and beauty, cosmetology, and pedicure, among other things. He utilized the typical rags-to-riches story in his interviews for the news outlets, and it's possible that he was never profitable in any of his businesses, because the key to this story, and ultimately his downfall, was his debt. The amount of debt he had incurred and the regular threats he received reinforced the theory that his death was a settling of scores related to money. Perez Algaba totals 12 bounce checks to the tune of 929,200 pesos, roughly 54,000 US dollars, although this debt was incurred by another one of his company's motors, Lettuce. His nickname was Lechuga, or Lettuce in Spanish, hence the company name. According to Central Bank Records, Segepa had seven bounce checks in the amount of 2.53 million pesos, roughly 146,000 US dollars. Based on the reporting from the Buenos Aires Times, Fernando's financial situation is starting to become more clear. He had an inheritance, blew his money on cars, trips, and poor trading decisions, and subsequently 
bounced checks from multiple companies. Fernando was a super reliable guy. Everybody trusted him. Then he started changing during the pandemic and started dealing with cryptocurrencies more and to borrow money from a lot of people, said Gonzalez, and added, he can't return the money and strangely overnight leaves the country, goes to Europe, and he can't be found anymore. We've seen many similar stories on my channel, haven't we? Someone borrows money because they thought they found a quick path to wealth, but what happens when the market turns or your skill was a false positive? My guess is he borrowed money and hired traders to make trades for him. At some point he was profitable and thought he was about to be super rich. In comes the cars, the pretty women, and expensive lifestyle. But what happens when the market turns? That's always the question to ask anyone who appears to have found a loophole. He was labeled as a crypto millionaire. My guess is he implemented risky trading that worked in the short term, but blew his accounts quickly. Risky traders always think they're just one trade away from getting back in the black, so they ask for a loan or credit. Fernando borrows money from him for the cryptocurrency business, then gives it back, then he borrows some again. He pays two of three installments of what he had promised plus interest and then vanishes. In all, he didn't give back close to $30,000, the lawyer pointed out. Spending years analyzing these stories has made me realize that people borrowing money for short-term trading usually aren't profitable and the liquidity is just bridging the gap from today to bankruptcy. Mattia confirmed that his friend Fernando bought and sold cryptocurrency and had not done well with that, although he clarified that at some point he was able to recover. It's interesting hearing that his close friend knew he wasn't successful with crypto trading, yet the New York Post, Buenos Aires Times, and other media outlets referred to him as a millionaire. I'm guessing his creditors thought he had assets and liquidity from his other business ventures. Despite Instagram feeling like a good way to perform due diligence on a potential business partner, it's not. Fool's gold. His friend admitted that he owed $300,000 to a man named Gustavo Iglesias, a well-connected member of the Barra Bravas, and the man whom the two fugitives point out as the author of the crime. And as we'll see in a minute, a very disturbing crime. According to Matia, Perez Algaba's main activity was the purchase and sale of motorcycles and cars in the Itu Zainga area of Buenos Aires. It's hard to believe he had that much debt from small purchases. It was likely something bigger. This article mentions that he was about to be outed as a member of a pyramid scheme. But again, zero evidence. The article further states that Perez Algaba was related to two of the people in charge of the company that attracted investors in Argentina. Given the amount of pyramid schemes that screw investors out of their money in the USA, I'm surprised these stories don't happen more often. The round of suspects for the traitor's murder has all kinds of shady characters, gangs, drug dealers, transnational organizations, business people, and even investors like the victim. A series of recorded messages sent by Perez Algaba point to Gustavo Iglesias and his son Nazarino, two characters linked to La 12, as the Boca Hooligan Gang is known. La 12 is the name for the Barra Brava of the Club Atletico Boca Juniors football team. The only thing in America that compares to these fans appears to be a stadium in the NFL playoffs filled with gangs from the south side of Chicago. This footage is really wild and intense. The only people who I've seen have the same energy are crypto bros rushing to defend their new altcoin. This clip by Vice into the Barra Bravas highlights just how dangerous these groups are. The reporter talked with members of the group on game day where viewers got an inside look at how these organizations operate. Fernando, owing money to the Barra Bravas, is, as most of this story goes, still just speculation. But if he did, this is a reminder of how dangerous your life can become if you borrow money from people who don't enjoy hearing you'll be late on payments. Pursuing a life with exotic cars, traveling, and what appears to be freedom can turn into a nightmare quickly if you aren't actually making money and if you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. And a nightmare is exactly what the Barra Bravas wanted, to send a message to anyone thinking of not paying their debts. The Grizzly case came to light after the kids found a red suitcase filled with body parts while playing near a stream in the town of Ingeniero Budge, Buenos Aires Province, on Sunday, Jam Press reported. While the kids may have a leg up on their classmates in anatomy, it's unfortunate finding that suitcase took away some of their innocence. News reports indicate that this appeared to be a professional hit. With the lifestyle he was flaunting, it was indicative of how some people can feel invincible with the risks they take, which can have very unfortunate outcomes when dealing with violent people. Prior to his death, Fernando posted that he knew his life was in danger. These news reports have also been able to uncover voice messages between Fernando and an acquaintance before his death, showing this as well. Later, a note written by Fernando was found. It reportedly read, Hello, well, in principle I apologize to all the people that I failed them and I could not pay them what they gave me. At first, this started as an investment in cryptocurrencies, and little by little, it got out of hand. Nothing that happened was on purpose. In each new attempt to get ahead, there was always the possibility of recovering what was lost, and there was the mistake. Fernando's alleged debts with Argentina's tax authorities were dubbed irrecoverable, further adding to his growing pressures. While investigating this video, I kept wondering if this could have been avoided. It's possible this was just a random set of events that had nothing to do with his debt, but it does appear that he lived a life above his means. He likely thought he had the skills to earn enough money to outpace his debts and pay everyone back from crypto trading. 
At some point, the debt burden is too high and the money dries up. His brother insists he wasn't a scammer and unlikely to have been involved with a criminal enterprise. Sad story for everyone involved. Be careful who you get into business with. Thanks for watching.